tenendo presente che però bisogna anche eh, creare gli smart company owned by shareholders is right if it is right and even if you deliver the profit of 100 million dollars in 10 years the shareholder will require you to deliver in a shorter time do it in eight years do it in five years if you have to deliver in less than five years you cannot do any manufacturing or research and development only viable business model is a financial model he probably going to include the, uh, our suggestions in the G20 uh, declarations, uh, which is going to be spoken out of the Japanese government. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. I wish to, to thank um, Mr. George Hara. Indeed, the meeting witnessed the, the signature uh, and of the emotion and, and um, I would like to thank the speaker because he gave really um, a good uh, course on on political economy uh, he gave impressive figures and uh, he brought even on the table this concept of uh, public interest capitalism again it's a, it's a reminder that in whatever we do we put human face on it. <coughs> because if human don't benefit, they will not work with you. Agreed. So I thank you for uh, your, your presentation. Um, so I go back to Milan, Mr. Marasa. We, we are about to conclude our, yeah, our session. Do you have um, a speaker yeah, now? Yeah, we have a
extend our session because we need to hear from you so the floor is open to, to to members of the panel who are here and also in Milan so um, can I uh, start by, by opening the floor here in New York then we come to Milan after yeah, for sure. I think, in fact, the, yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go. I don't know if there are demands of, uh, to talk the phone here, but uh, let's start in New York. Zip. People tell me I'm almost a billionaire. I don't know. But, you know, that's what I, people say that I am. Um, how do you get from without to be with? You have to have education. You have to have direction. And you have to look at who is successful. The lacking are the one that is without food, without education, without this and without that. Who have? A little country called the Netherlands, the Dutch. It's the second largest food exporter in the world. Tiny little place. The second largest food exporter in the world. Shouldn't we begin to tell our children to learn from them a little bit? How could this tiny little place called the Netherlands be so big, matching almost United States in export values in agricultural products? We should begin to learn. There are successes in this world. I don't believe in blaming different systems, because every system has its flaws. And what I think is that we should look into a country, a small little country called Israel, who could produce food at 2% of the water consumed with their special intelligent agriculture. Do not blame, you guys are educated. You guys probably all are college grad, master degree, this and that. Extend your knowledge to the ones that are without knowledge. Two percent of the water in the middle of the desert could produce as much food as 100 percent. Maybe we should go and learn from them rather than start blaming. What is poor? Poor is without. What is Israel without? It's in the middle of a desert. I was in Negev Desert doing experiments a long time ago. It's without. So if you are able to produce just as much food at 2% of the water consumed, you're no longer without. So you have to say 2% is the water. What do we do at, at that place? Well, there are water fog harvesting techniques that you could harvest water from fogs. At 2% uh, of water consumed, now you could afford to use agriculture through desalination, using different kind of vacuum system that will reduce the cost of production of water, uh, clear water by 75%. These are just little knowledge that I was managing together when I was a child. And where did I get my knowledge? Donnell Library, Mid Manhattan Library, Brooklyn Library. There are no books about agriculture in those three libraries that I did not at least touched. So you have to ask yourself, you are leaders. Tell your children to go to libraries, and thank God we have free library in this city, to learn. Identify your problem. What are you without? And then you will be with. Thank you very much. 
I thank you. I thank you, and I, I think the round of applause you, you, you get is a sign that your message you went through. And, and I, I, I could not agree more, more with you um, be, because, remember, the, the Green Revolution was resource-intensive. We had to pump billions of uh, gallons of water to produce one kilo or, or 100 kilos of rice. The next revolution will be knowledge intensive. So I think uh, uh, you, you, you went right to the point. But before I give the floor to, uh, to the next speaker, can I invite uh, George Hara? Mm -hmm. Because I think that is your domain also. It's, it's your element. Can you reflect on that? Yeah. The, I, yeah thank you for your, com <laughs> your comment, and I, I totally agree with you. There are so many uh, technologies available. We can use it. And also, the, I was so active in uh, 19 nations in Africa. Actually, there is no real shortage of the food. For instance, they have the tomatoes. Probably 80% of them are wasted. They do not have the technologies or the method to storage. So I think we can do a lot of the improvement in the many aspects. But the important thing is uh, in any agricultures, if the farmer can get, cannot get any benefit out of that, if the conglomerate manage these agricultural uh, the the uh, businesses, if, if the shareholder can benefit just for themselves, it doesn't work. It is not sustainable. The whole purpose is, as I explained, to make everyone rich. We don't need any extremely rich people in the world, but we have to take care of the poor people. Thank you very much uh, um, for your answer. Um, Maybe one or two more speakers. <coughs> then we will uh, have to end the meeting. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Bukuru from Milan. Uh, just uh, uh, to prevent uh, our friends in New York that uh, in uh, 10 minutes we have to leave because we finish with the time of our, of our video conference. We continue to follow the UR session uh, only, uh, at, only for the next 10 minutes. Then we have to close the video conference. But uh, just to inform you that uh, in a moment we will, uh, we will view. Bruno, I, I guarantee you that this session will end within 10 minutes. So bear with us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We will finish together. It's okay. A, thank you very much for this. Thank you. For George Hara, so, have, is there a, 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 a way to get your corporations themselves to see their enlightened self-interest in pursuing the line of reasoning that you have so brilliantly uh, shown us? Or uh, is this something that will have to be done uh, by you know, fixing you know, evident deficiencies of public policy? Thank you. In, uh, <coughs> to encourage the cooperation to that ways, we have to make some changes, like taxation system, if the government gives the, the better tax this, uh, framework for the long-term investors and high taxation for the short-term uh, speculators, then greedy people can shift to the long term because they can make better and more money if they do it that way. And also there are many other things like uh, accounting systems, Today, the accounting system is not based on book values. If we can go back to the book values, the, there is a, we can, we can uh, decrease the room of, of the speculations. So change in the accounting system is another way to do it. So there are so many ways. <laughs> and actually, the Mr. Toyota of Toyota Motors, he says, my company is uh, based on the public interest capitalism. There are more than 500 major Japanese corporations and European corporations 
are following after the public in interest capitalism. Um, another comment from the audience. If not, um, I would like to thank you uh, for your participation at this session. And before we, we conclude, I would like to, to give a minute to the members of the panel to capture what is really the, the take-out message. I would start by uh, my neighbor. What is your take-out message you want us to go with? Yeah, we have to concentrate. We have to concentrate on how financing goes. It is so important, and uh, we think that it will happen, but it doesn't happen automatically. So we have to work on that as much as land and the other sources. So, thank you. Thank you very much. One minute to give us. Here, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Decca here could uh, yeah, yes, take please. the opportunity to speak with you, you offer. Please. Yes, I, we, we are doing, uh, I think, a, a good job educating the people to the technology and to use the computers. We are doing that with a few, uh, with the only uh, uh, money that the ST Microelectronics is giving us. I think that uh, with the uh, support of the country or other uh, international, uh, we can improve uh, much better and, uh, uh, and do much more than uh, what you are doing. Another point I agree is with, with Mr. Ara is that, uh, it, and it was the principle with which uh, Pasquale Pistorio and Kofi Annan did, he dedicated uh, the 1% of the, uh, of the <coughs> profit of the company to uh, this uh, chart. So uh, I think that if all the company do that, we will have much, much more uh, people educated to so use the technology the than we are doing now. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, so can I now give the floor to Ambassador uh, Hara? Uh, maybe I... I I should tell you that he's a, he's a special advisor to the Prime Minister of Japan. So we have been very fortunate to have him here. So you, you want to give us a, a take-out message so that oh, yeah. we close the meeting? Yeah. I, I, I. What I talk today, I'm going to do it. I think, uh, please think about what you can do to change the world, I think there are so many ways you can step ahead. The execution is very important. Discussion is very important, but the execution is more important. Together with uh, Pierre Power today, with the Ocam and Alliance from Foundation, we're going to do it. And I thank you very much. Uh, uh, Bruno, do you have um, a takeout? Or shall we close the meeting? No, uh, um, it's okay. I think that we had, uh, as usual, a very uh, important discussion. As Mr. Ara said, uh, it's important to, the, the, the discuss, to discuss, but it's important also to implement, to execute uh, important decisions that, by the way, has been taken sometimes from uh, international institutions including the European Union, is, uh, uh, we have uh, many programs that uh, are uh, well inspired, but uh, we know also the implementation and the execution of the, the not only development program, but investment program, uh, namely in Africa, require more, stronger efforts, stronger efforts to, to realize uh, concrete uh, goals in this uh, direction. But we, we have no alternative. We have to continue on this. Thank you very much, uh, very much for your attention in New York. <coughs> and thank you to Mr. Bukuro for the great cooperation uh, again we, we, we had to this, uh, the, uh, today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I wish to thank my co-chair and uh, I declare the session uh, over now.
Thank you very much for your participation. Suffering through his foundation. And last, last Christmas, uh, Christmas, Chris left us. Uh, may I have just a, a video? And uh, we invite uh, Nikki Smith uh, to join us here. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. I also want to thank Pierre Apollo, who um, has got me involved with this, um, got our foundation involved for the last 10 years, on and off. Um, we've gotten more involved in the last two years. Uh, we got very interested when the uh, climate summit came up in Africa. And uh, we know through our experience that uh, one of the missing ingredients in many times with um, any type of, of plans like this or government plans or is uh, the, the mental health, uh, wellness, we could also call it, um, and alcohol and drugs and how these things play a role in uh, when people want to get good things done. Uh, we need to also address some of the obstacles that could get in the way of trying to um, promote health, wellness, uh, food security, and other things. Uh, we believe that the, through smartphone technology, especially with the ICTs uh, in Africa and uh, throughout other parts of the world that are remote, we could bring uh, universities such as Columbia University right to small villages in rural uh, parts of Africa as an example for some concrete information on how this is done and how it's been done. So without further ado, I will give you Dr. Milton Weinberg. I is all blue and I see clouds of white and the brightness of day. I like the dark and the Think to myself, what a wonderful world. To have uh, his wife, Nikki Smitzer, we continue to his mission with Smitzer Foundation. So we'll give uh, a special pledge. Thank you. Thank you to your uh, great. Uh, and the memory of trees. Thank you. We never forget Chris for his great humanity and really great devoted to the SDGs and to also our mission. So now we start the next session. The chair is uh, his Excellency Chris Williams, you have the floor and start uh, as a chair the session, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here today um, among colleagues and uh, participants in this important meeting. Um, I wanted to just give a brief overview of um, aspects of, of poverty and information technology from an urban perspective at a global level. Um, I work with the part of the UN system that uh, is charged um, and mandated to focus on uh, affordable housing, um, informal settlement upgrading, um, and urban development, sustainable urban development. Um, we are uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, where we have our world headquarters. 
um, most of the UN agencies you would think are only uh, here in New York, but in, in fact there are five global duty stations of the UN system, uh, both the United Nations Environmental Program um, and the Habitat and Human Settlements uh, are based in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. So we have our global operations with uh, offices here in New York to represent the UN system. Um, I'm happy to say that the UN system and member states generally have um, taken the urban turn. They have recognized that the world's population is now majority urban and by 2050 will be 70 percent urban. So very rural parts of the world are rapidly becoming urban. Um, and this process of urbanization um, both affects rural areas and urban areas. And we have to be mindful not just of cities, but what we refer to as national development from an urban perspective. The kind of infrastructure development, where cities are located, the network of cities, how they relate to ur rural areas is increasingly important as the world makes this demographic shift. Um, the international community has come to an understanding of the importance of this uh, by dedicating one of the 17 goals of the Sustainable Development Goals on cities and communities. Um, this is something that was unimaginable even 10 years ago, that the international community would recognize uh, urban development and uh, human settlements development as a priority. Um, so it's a huge step forward, I think, uh, for governments, um, non-governmental organizations, mayors, businesses, um, investors, uh, community organizations, um, particularly urban uh, social movements, uh, as well as the UN system to have this uh, elevated to the, the status of a goal. Um, the, importantly, that the goals are not confined to the UN. This is, uh, I think, what's nice about the Sustainable Development Goals that are different than the Millennium Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals are owned by all of us, and they are universal. They apply as much to people in this city as they do to people living in Nairobi, Kenya. So I think it's important that we look at the Sustainable Development Goals um, from this perspective. Uh, they're owned by all of us, and we've, as, a, as a global community, we've signed up to try to achieve the targets that are specified in those by 2030. Um, as UN Habitat, we have been tasked by the UN system to lead a system-wide strategy for urban uh, that would involve all parts of the UN system. And this was recently approved um, uh, by the senior management board of the UN system uh, just, last, uh, just last week. So we are pleased that uh, progress has been made. What are the basic elements of this? Well, urban is a very complex issue, um, so we felt that it was important to put urban in the context of major global challenges that the world is facing. The first, which I think this meeting is really about, is to deal with inequality and to deal with poverty reduction. So this is one um, area that we feel that if you look seriously at urbanization, you'll make a dent into this large problem. The second one is economic development. Over 70 percent of a uh, country's economic wealth is often derived from urban areas. Um, how this is in, in the form of labor, in the form of economic productivity, information exchange, trade, it's happening in cities. So the, how we move forward with cities would become really important uh, as a contribution to overall economic development, which will be an important ingredient to, pro to try to provide the social protection investments that are necessary to deal with inequality. Um, the third major area uh, is what we're all facing as an international community, which is climate change. Um, urban and climate change are intimately related. There are 3,000 cities in the world of 500,000 people or more that are going to double in the next 40 years. So if we don't have an urban solution to climate change, we don't have a solution to climate change. Very important area of work that the international community uh, has agreed to work towards together. And la I'd like to turn the floor uh, to um, uh, Nikki Smithers, uh, the president of the Smithers Foundation. Thank you. You have the floor. Hi. I would like to first thank Pier Paolo Saprito for inviting me here today. And um, I'm truly honored to accept the award uh, on behalf of my late husband who I miss dearly. And I know that um, you would <laughs> you would love to be here today. Oh, yeah. And I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, 
I really love to be here today and I'm going to make sure that I carry on his passion that he had in helping other people and I'm sorry. And our foundation is very proud to work with with OCAM and uh, with the new development of the uh, SmartBox 4D. Thank you. Thank you. We know um, uh, his spirit is with us as we move forward with this initiative. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we now turn to Ar Armando Gonzalez, uh, who will be speaking on behalf of um, uh, the uh, Gobernado Nacional Indígena, Mexico. Hi, Chair uh, Paulo. Uh, I would like to explain, as a founder of this organization 20 years ago, one, I want to tell you how pleased I was to see Nikki here because her mother in law, Adele Smithers, was one of our first main sponsors. And her late husband, unfortunately, who died, Christopher, was very involved with this organization. The whole family were against any kind of liquor or drug or anything that could destroy any person's brain. But what's important is that Nikki, third generation now, is carrying on, and I congratulate her, because the family are founders. And I would like to add, I'm in the background, but I'm a founder. So uh, now I want to explain what's close to me. This gentleman from Mexico represent, he doesn't speak English, that's why I'm talking. He represents 35 million Mexicans. And he's not wearing an Armando suit. It's what they wear in Mexico in the region he comes from. It's their national dress. So you don't see him running around at the big fancy parties or parliamentarian events. The president of Mexico ran on the platform of what he is going to do and realizes has to be done by Mexico for their fellow Mexicans. His name is Armando Gomez. Well, I'm from a Spanish family. My mother was Spanish. Usually we have four or five or six names. He's simply Armando Gomez. But you're talking to the new gateway, to the new president of Mexico and his platform where he's going. In the meantime, I would like to present this gentleman, Luis Galvez, who has just been made an honorary ambassador. So Luis is traveling with Armando, and he, of course, speaks Spanish, if there's any need here. Armando, explain about your people and what they want. And what I would like to add, which was appropriate, that Adele Smithers worked with these groups in Mexico, helping them to realize, don't drink, don't take drugs, look for the future, look for your children, and work. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Antes que nada, darle las gracias al señor presidente de la OCC AM, el señor Pierre Paolo Saporito, por su gentil invitación a participar en este magno evento, y a doña Gloria Starkin, por su gran labor y en la logística. Y, y, los, y las flores que hemos recibido por parte de, de ella. El apoyo que nos ha dado es impresionante. No me imaginé que la gobernatura nacional indígena estuviera presen, presente en este gran eh, edificio que solamente por televisión veíamos. Pero mi intención de todo esto es hacerle la extensión a través de mi voz, de nuestro gran emperador mexica, don Hipólito Arrea Poté, gobernador nacional indígena, que representa poco más de 35 millones de indígenas en México y creemos que son 12 millones en Estados Unidos y 4 millones aproximadamente de la gente que vive en las sierras, en las montañas, que no tienen identificación, 
pero que la Gobernatura Nacional Indígena está preparada para poder acobijar a toda esa gente olvidada y hacer la extensión de que los indígenas tenemos voz, tenemos voto, estamos registrados en México, sin embargo nosotros como un ente no somos asociación civil, somos una organización autónoma por usos y costumbres y reconocido por la Constitución en el artículo 2 y lo más importante, reconocido por el Congreso de la Unión y la Suprema Corte de Justicia. Eso nos avala que somos un grupo en donde tenemos voz y voto y hoy que estamos presentes aquí, extenderles la invitación a que somos un grupo que creemos muy fuerte con eh, grandes eh, extensiones de terreno, grandes ideas, nuestros indígenas no solamente están olvidados, hay gente que es muy estudiada, hay gente que, que está abogando porque les ayuden, pero no queremos dinero, queremos hacer sinergia con todos ustedes, porque nuestra población eh, es bastante y hay que sacarla de, de, de esa marginación. Por eso hago voz y voto para que, haciendo alianzas y sinergias con cada uno de los países del mundo, y que ya hemos empezado a hacer eh, importantes acuerdos internacionales para poder promover nuestros productos indígenas alrededor de todo el mundo. Hoy por hoy sabemos que la Gobernatura Nacional Indígena es un ente que no estaba, eh, eh, de alguna manera no estaba difundida a nivel mundial y hoy, para nosotros es un gran logro estar aquí con ustedes. Hemos hecho acuerdos que, eh, que como embajador de paz y de economía de la Gobernatura Nacional Indígena, hemos estado en diferentes países haciendo grandes labores y hoy nos encontramos con ustedes para poder expresarles que nosotros tenemos la necesidad de hacer acuerdos con todos ustedes. Les agradezco mucho, les presento a Luis Galvis, eh, con quien hemos eh, trabajado bastante arduo en estos últimos tiempos para hacer al alianzas con diferentes partes del mundo. Les agradezco mucho, en nombre de nuestro gobernador nacional indígena Hipólito Arriaga Poté, el Consejo de Ancianos y toda la gente que participa dentro de estos grupos, les extendemos y les hacemos la invitación que estamos abiertos para con ustedes en todos los aspectos. Somos una, un grupo amigable, somos un, un grupo con el espíritu amplio de poder hacer grandes alianzas con ustedes. Galvis es nuestro representante aquí a nivel mundial, como embajador de paz y haciendo alianzas estratégicas. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Well, thank you very much. I'll try to uh, summarize. It's going to be hard, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll I reduce it into the just. Uh, and it was very um, uh, emotional uh, speech. Thanking uh, uh, Mr. Saporito, thanking Doña Gloria for all the support and on realizing something that they, uh, to be in this building, the, in his own words, they only saw in TV. Uh, there, there was no way for them to even dream of being here one day. And thanks to the changing world and the changing philosophies in his country, um, like uh, Gloria said, the new president's uh, platform is towards uh, helping the indigenous people of Mexico be uh, uh, adapt, um, be brought into a society where they've been uh, put away for a long, long time, al almost since uh, the conquista. And uh, through uh, reform and through um, initiatives like this one, we've been able to uh, to go places and establish alliances uh, strategically. Uh, that I'll go a little bit into it in a presentation I have, uh, a real quick one. Uh, he came in representation of Mr. Hipólito uh, Arriagapote, who's the, who's the governor of the indigenous people of uh, Mexico and the Mexica people. Uh, basically, there are 35, about 35 million people in Mexico and about 12 million on this side of the border in the United States. Of course, they didn't have any borders before the border was there. And still, they, they have their own uh, customs, their own laws, their own uh, languages. There are six, 62 ethnic, uh, ethnic um, um, people, 
ethnic people. They speak their own language and have their own customs. And he, he wanted to uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I'll go a little bit into what we've done in the last year. I was here um, in the previous conference, uh, gave a presentation on just a little segment of our project, but through the year, it, it just mushroomed into something else that I'd like to go into. Yeah. How can I uh, Yeah. At the end with the, hang on. Uh, well, how can I uh, do the, uh, the presentation? The presentation needs to be turned on. global economy. Uh, the one symbol on the side of the pyramid, that's the, the people of Mexico's uh, indigenous sign. And through a development of our, of our own technology down there, we were able to uh, reach parts of the world that we only thought possible before. Uh, we went to um, China on a, on a business trip uh, that came as a result of this, um, this forum last year. And we're able to establish bilateral agreements with uh, uh, the Chinese people and uh, in a way that they will be buying the production, uh, their agricultural production, and they'll be helping develop some of the land that they have that is not developed at this point. Okay, can we go into the next uh, one more? Okay, this was the project last year. It was a basic project of uh, what we all here for, the agriculture, renewable energy, the water, and uh, uh, the basic needs for the, the people there. And it developed into some more. Can we go in the next one? That was uh, the original um, rural coverage for broadband. That's what brought me here last year, uh, trying to get telemedicine, teleeducation, and uh, all the connectivity to them that they don't have right now. In the area of telemedicine, we're able to uh, uh, took a leap um, step this year with the help of uh, a company whose representative is sitting there, uh, Telemed uh, ClickMix, uh, where we can uh, do remote uh, diagnostic of th these people with a uh, very minimum uh, uh, investment. As, as we all know, there is uh, not enough doctors for all the people in the world. So we're spreading uh, the diagnostic of them into the world and able to get uh, quick results and save lives that were not saved before. Can we do the next slide? Uh, this is what I went into. The, we went into China with the CATIS, which is the Chinese uh, Association of Trading, and uh, able to uh, we signed bilateral agreements. Next uh, slide, please. And then in doing so, we needed a platform to conduct uh, the transactions. So we developed our own blockchain uh, technology and platform called Valor Indígena, which uh, will encompass uh, not only their um, production, but over 1,500 companies in Mexico, 1,500 producers in Mexico that are, uh, we sign agreements in this platform. For not only for support to the indigenous, but for their own development of their uh, markets. Uh, next. Uh, one more, please. Uh, this is part of our trip to uh, China, signing of the agreements with the uh, Chinese authorities, and uh, doing some exchange as far as uh, technology for the future production of certain technological products by the, the indigenous people of Mexico and help their development in that area as well. Uh, next. In uh, Mexico, there was a collaboration signed last uh, week with Conacintra, which is the entity that encompasses this 1,500, uh, over 1,500 industries in Mexico. And they join our effort and platform, blockchain platform to uh, develop uh, our mutual business. Next. Uh, that, there's a video, but it's not available in this presentation. It's just about the signing and, and uh, signing of the agreements in China. Next. 
And this is just uh, some of the activities that took uh, last year. Uh, the top right is uh, the leader of the indigenous people, Ariaga Pote, with the president of Mexico, uh, AMLO, is called. Uh, in the middle uh, is me and uh, the, the governor. Also to the top uh, left is some agreements that we established with the principal of St. Stephen, who are a big supporter of our cause, and, uh, and other agreements that were signed through the years. If you can see in the center picture, there, uh, Mr. Hippolyto has a baton. That baton used to belong to Montezuma and is over 500 years old. And it represents the 500, uh, uh, 500 uh, t uh, towns or, um, or uh, colonies that Montezuma had in his empire all through, uh, all through the Americas. Montezuma covered from Canada all the way south in uh, South America. And we're, uh, all the indigenous people are from the same, basically the same, um, the same descendants. And um, next, please. So as I say, we're building all these uh, bridges and platforms, and uh, in doing so, we run into people that are helping helping us uh, internationally, like uh, Mr. Adrian here. Adrian uh, he will be talking briefly after me. He's, uh, he's in charge of the financial side at international level. He brings all this uh, um, uh, expertise and investors uh, from the world that are interested in not only helping our people, but to develop uh, their business in all this side of the world. And in doing so, we all, um, it's a win-win situation and, uh, and we all um, benefit from it. So uh, I'll leave Adrian to explain just briefly uh, what he does on our behalf, and I thank you very much for your attention. Yes, uh, Adrian, thank you very much. Left-hand side. Uh, you good? It's good. Okay. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Saporito for uh, inviting us to communicate our uh, plans to develop and to improve the life of a lot of people. I also like to talk Gloria, which uh, only work half a day, 12 hours, to put us together and to create a platform on which we can. Uh, which you can improve and create more new things. I want you to understand, in my opinion, the, everything which people speak here is true, but the reality is that the technology, technology part of what we have right now took hundreds of years to build and was a vertical, vertical, uh, vertical, uh, vertical process. Now we have to take this vertical process to take them in an horizon, horizontal process where everybody can benefit from this technology. The technology has to have access, like has to learn from everybody. The technology is going to give us access to the library, to the knowledge of Israel, to create water from salty water, to create new things. Now, this project which you have over here was inspiring because the number of people is very big. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's millions of people which are going to be benefit directly from our work. No, they are going to contact. They are going to do direct contact with, big peop with, with great people like China, like uh, Europe and like other places, R remember one thing, they don't have a structure to market their product. We're gonna take their product, they're gonna, we're gonna take their product to the international market, and then we're gonna create new product. Now, the, the target is, you know, we only live, we only have one life. If we have two life, we'll be better. We're going to learn them from the first life, and we're going to use it the second life. And one life is short, and this short time, 
we have to make a difference. And what a difference we want to make, we want to take this, this uh, indigenous people to teach the children how to get access to this knowledge to teach the children is not going to be easy. It's not going to be one year, two year, three year. Probably I'm not going to be here, but I think his children are going to be in a different level of, of a different level of knowledge. The people which develop this knowledge are few, not many. The moment we go horizontal will be wonderful that their life is going to be improved and happy. And what, uh, what happy means, you know, a child five years old, tell his mother, tell him, you know, you're, you're going to be happy. When he was 12 years old, they asked him, what do you want to do? He said, I want to be happy. And then the teacher said, what do you mean you want to be happy? He said, he, said, he doesn't know. <laughs> he doesn't know. I want to Thank you for letting me speak, and I want you to understand that tomorrow it's a new day. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for that group of speeches. Uh, really so appreciate it. The conclusion it. is we can thank Pierre Paolo because Luis came here last year, and he listened to this whole room full of brains. And he then, he's Mexican, went back to Mexican and realized the platform of this organization is serious. It's not just talk. And if the people here will now start activating and meeting each other, because there are people flying in who may never meet each other again if you don't shake hands and start saying to each other, what the hell are you doing here and who do you represent? So if anybody wants to do anything with the, this Mexican group, it's not me. I'm in media. And in media, you just tell people what's going on. The key is sitting right here, Luis Galvez, who flew in from Mexico, and Armando, who flew in, for only two, three days to talk to you. So get to them. If you if, don't feel you can't call them, don't feel you can't connect with them, that's what it's all about, and that's why they're back this year. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for that call to action. Um, uh, we, now, we now turn to Eugene Grant, who is the mayor of uh, St. Pleasant, uh, Seat Pleasant. Seat Pleasant uh, Maryland. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so very much, Chris, and we appreciate your leadership in shepherding us through uh, this process. Uh, let me begin by expressing my deep appreciation to uh, Pierpaolo uh, for his gracious invitation uh, to present for the third time here at OCAM and the 19th Annual Info Poverty World Conference. It is a great honor to share our experiences and expertise alongside so many other leaders from around uh, our world, and we appreciate each of your contributions uh, that you make to our effort. Our presentation is coming up uh, in just a moment here on uh, the video screen, and you, our presentation will get you the um, link we don't do PowerPoints, so it's a web-based uh, presentation, and so it will be updated periodically from this conference uh, as, as you go uh, forward, um, because sometimes you'll need updates uh, to the presentation. But see Pleasant, Maryland, just to real quickly to remind those of you that were here the past couple of years and those who are new, uh, the Sea Pleasant, Maryland is outside of our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and we are a small community of about 0.7 square miles, a population of less than 5,000. In the United States, there are 80% um, of the cities in the United States have populations of, of, of 10,000 or less, and 60% have populations of 5,000 or less. So the vast majority of the cities in the United States are, are very small, but they have significant uh, residents that desire to have quality services just like large cities as a Singapore or a New York uh, City. In today's presentation, I will discuss two of the UN Sustainable Development Goals 
as well as recommended solutions on how they can be addressed by citing what we have accomplished in Sea Pleasant. We've been able to do this, Pierpaolo, by undergoing a digital transformation that establishes both human and digital connectivity, that generates data for analyses, creating a shared services hub which empowers our entire government and provides citizen-centric services. Goal number four, which aims to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. And goal number 11 aims to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Let's first discuss sustainable development goal number four. Target 4.4 .4 aims to substantially increase the number of youth and adults who have relevant skills, including technical and vocational skills, for employment, decent jobs, and entrepreneurship. As our community continues to grow, and as smart city technologies become more and more prevalent, residents worry that they will lose jobs to people from outside of the community, as well as to technologies such as artificial intelligence, which are changing the future of work. However, even though some jobs will be lost, what some people fail to realize is that smart technologies will in turn bring new jobs that do not exist or have not existed previously. To address some of these challenges and thereby make progress towards this goal, and in keeping with our commitment to a citizen-centric approach, we have created a smart cities curriculum that is robust as well as affordable in partnership with our local college the Prince George's Community College. This curriculum aims to retrain adults in the community and equip them with ICT skills necessary to compete for these new jobs. Graduates of this program will have a certification showing competencies in smart city technologies, the Internet of Things, and data analytics, just to name a few. In addition, as members of our community gain these skills, Seat Pleasant, a smart city of excellence, will benefit as this will help us attract businesses who might otherwise refuse to locate here on the premise that the workforce is not ready and have not the appropriate skill sets. In addition to the curriculum, we have also created the My Seat Pleasant app that, among its many features, provides residents with access to job postings at the city, county, and the greater Washington metropolitan region. Now let's discuss sustainable development goal number 11. Target 11.5 of this goal aims to reduce the impact of natural disasters with a focus on protecting the poor. In Sea Pleasant, we have a 16% unemployment rate and a 17% poverty rate. And these are the people who would be hurt most by a disaster. To address this challenge, we're currently constructing an emergency management center equipped with the resources and software necessary to help us proactively prepare for disasters and put in place the measures necessary to protect the most vulnerable of our population. Target 11.6, Pierpaolo, of this goal aims to reduce the adverse effects of poor air quality and poor management of municipal waste. Smart city technologies have immense potential to make progress towards addressing this goal. In our city, we have installed air quality sensors in key locations. Not only do we aim to measure the air quality of our city, but we also aim to provide residents with recommendations on the best times to be outdoors. This is especially important for some of our residents who are challenged with chronic asthma and respiratory ailments. In addition, we have installed smart sensor-enabled trash cans throughout the city. These trash cans alert our city staff when they're close to capacity, and thus we're able to ensure that our trash cans are not overflowing and that our streets and parks remain clean. Target 11B 
calls on institutions and governments around the world to adopt and implement comprehensive plans for ensuring the inclusivity, safety, resiliency, and sustainability of cities. To that end, we have developed a comprehensive ICT strategic plan that sets forth a strategy for addressing the challenges facing our city with the implementation of smart city technologies. With great pride, Pierpaolo, we have published our first ICT strategic plan, which we are introducing today for the very first time at this conference. We do not have a paper copy because we're trying to be environmentally friendly. So therefore, if you would like to have a copy of the strategic plan, go to C. Pleasant's website and you can review it there. In conclusion, it is always an honor for me to present in this historic building, the United Nations, and before this annual conference to share with you the FC Pleasant a Smart City of Excellence as the world's first authentic small smart city. As I have spoken and given to this August body our thoughts and advice on ways in which we can successfully achieve some of the 17 sustainable development goals, I leave you with the words by the late Ralph Bunch, former UN ambassador and Nobel Prize winner for peace, articulated in his acceptance speech, and I quote, may there be morality in the relations among nations. May there be in our time at long last a world at peace in which we, the people, may for once begin to make full use of the great good that is in all of us. We as leaders representing sovereigns from around the world have a great opportunity in achieving the sustainable development goals and thereby further advance our collective and unified position in making real the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights for All. Thank you very much. One can only imagine if Ralph Bunch were alive today. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me uh, now turn to uh, Jasmina Bojok uh, to give um, a, a brief presentation, please. Jasmina? Uh, yeah. Chair, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Yasmina Boyish, and I'm the, uh, the founder director of the United Nations Association Film Festival at Stanford University in Palo Alto. It's been a long time that Pierre Paolo and I are working together and uh, reflecting on some of the topics that we are talking today through film and using documentaries as an educational tool. So uh, I'm so happy that you mentioned Ralph Bunch. Uh, so we presented so many times documentary about Ralph Bunch and my students at Stanford, they don't know about this film and they don't know so much about the uh, once the most important and actually the first person of color, uh, African-American who won Nobel Prize before President Obama. So it's a fascinating to be in this building and of course mention his name so many times. I really appreciate that and I really recommend you to use a documentary, Rough Bunch and American Odyssey for your educational uh, tools. So the film that we are going to see, uh, uh, we are talking about um, villages around the world and about uh, poverty, inequality, but what we are going to see in our next film uh, this is a part of our United Nations Association Film Festival, is about slums. Every sixth person in the world lives in slums today. So you can imagine one billion people live in slums. What does it mean for all of us? You'll see from the film when we reflect from Canada to India, Morocco, France, and New York, and we'll see how people live and we'll think about the way how we have to develop cities in the future. So I'm going to be here also after the film to help you, but I do have some stickers for you uh, that you can visit our website, which is unaff.org, and be informed about the films and the possibilities. Uh, we partner with different nonprofit organizations. We present these films in a different communities and we are based in San Francisco and at Stanford University. So thank you again for your intention. Uh, let's see the film and I'm going to be here after the documentary to answer some of your questions. And I'll give you also these stickers. Thank you.
think this is a tall order. It's Friday afternoon, and uh, this is the toughest session to be had. But I think what really goes our way is that we have an extensive uh, list of speakers uh, that come from a variety of backgrounds. And a topic that really uh, is, is very challenging and, and multidimensional. So we, we're really looking at this point in, in, in terms of different uh, ICT tools that can help development not only in the city through a smart city project or uh, the ICT village, but how these different uh, initiatives for different levels can be integrated. Um, clearly in our moment in which we live, uh, these kind of, um, that, this binarity between the city and, and the rural or the urban has potentially a stronger significance than in 10, 15 years ago. We, we see that certain social divisions exist, and then many in the periphery, in the rural areas, feel uh, very much neglected. We see that in terms of um, um, elections, political movements. We also see that in development community where there is uh, uh, a need to not only address the, the urban poor, but also uh, address the, the periphery. And so in this discussion uh, here, we will try to see from very different angles how these issues of integration, of social integration, using ICT, uh, understanding also uh, different uh, sectors in terms of uh, the, the urban and the rural uh, can in fact be um, integrated and what sort of initiatives uh, can actually make a difference. So without further ado, I would like to um, invite uh, the representative of UNICEF in this event, um, uh, Naroa Zurutuza, who has not had the chance to speak in the pr previous panel to follow up and use that as uh, a connecting narrative for what we're going to be talking today. I invite the speakers to uh, be fairly brief because we have 10 names on the list and so roughly seven minutes would be perfect if we can get there. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. Hello everyone, this is Naroa from the Office of Innovation at UNICEF. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for having us here. It's a pleasure. And it's funny because UNICEF, our Office of Innovation at UNICEF, we've been working on this concept of information poverty for a few years now. We've been trying to develop a framework around access to information, information poverty, and how can we empower children and youth through information for a while now. So it's really great to see all these people that are also working around this topic. I, I'm going to start telling you a little bit more about the motivation behind why UNICEF is working on this topic. And then I'm going to move to some more concrete work that we are currently doing. So the, the girl that you see on that slide, it's a girl that I met in Manaus, the capital city of the Amazon in Brazil. Uh, I met her in a, a urban settlement over there and her, her family was coming from a very rural community in the Amazon. It was a community that you could only reach by boat, that could take even up to uh, nine, nine hours to get there by boat. So it was a very disconnected, remote community. And that means that you often don't have access to basic services such as doctors, uh, teachers, etc. And that's why her family had to move to, to the capital. Uh, to solve this type of issues, actually, the government of Brazil has a very great initiative where they deliver secondary education to these remote communities via satellite connectivity. They have production studios in the capital, in Manaus, and they deliver real-time satellite lessons to these communities where students can also ask questions. And this means that uh, the, the kids, that, that girl that I showed in the first slide, can learn, can have access to the right information, and we can provide them with equal access to opportunity and choice eventually. So we started from that, and our UNICEF's goal is to make sure that every child has this access to the information, this equal access to opportunity, and that we bring this to even the most rural areas. But for that, we realized that in order for the government of Brazil to put the dish in the school, they first need to know where the schools are. 
if they don't know where the schools are, if they don't know which ones are connected, they cannot really make any proper plans to, to provide the right infrastructure. Um, and if we give you a map, an empty map, it will be very hard to, to locate the, or place the schools over there. So that's where our Project Connect initiative started, where we are mapping school connectivity globally. We've used different techniques. We've worked with governments, tech companies, mobile network operators, and over the last couple of years, we've mapped over half a million schools, and we have connectivity data for more than 120,000 of them. And these are uh, some examples of how this mapping has been used by different countries and by different governments. So, for example, in Colombia, we've mapped over almost 50,000 schools, and we've partnered with companies like Red Hat to build some prototypes so that the government can use this to better prepare for emergencies. And they are listed uh, for this panel, so uh, I have a pleasure to uh, offer the floor to uh, Mr. Ivan Shumkov, who is the president of Academy Built Association. Um, may I have the slides that we have prepared? And can you make it full screen? If you press Control L, it, can you press Control L? It's going to happen automatically. Or just make Control L on your on your keyboard. Control L. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, it's it's easier than it seems. <laughs> It's not a password. It works on every PC and Mac computer. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you so much for inviting me, Pier Paolo, to speak at this uh, conference. My name is Ivan Shumkov. I'm an architect, entrepreneur, and professor of architecture uh, here in New York City, uh, also founder of the Build Academy. Uh, our work ranges from topics related to the built environment we are focusing uh, particularly on the topic of resilient and sustainable cities. And we are very fortunate to be, play, to be based in a city like New York, which I think it's um, one of uh, the greatest cities to live in and, uh, and to work with in. However, not that many people as, are as fortunate as we are to be in such a, a well-planned and uh, functional and relatively resilient and smart city. Uh, even if it's resilient, uh, or we thought it was resilient, when Hurricane Sandy happened about six years ago, half of the city was without electricity and water uh, for um, more than a week. So I, I got to experience uh, the need for resilience firsthand. Most of the world, in fact 90% of the world, according to the UN, lives in substandard conditions. And if you can... Uh, and a lot of those are happening due to natural disasters. So you can see here a map of natural disasters, earthquakes, uh, typhoons, uh, landslides, uh, floods. And unfortunately, some of the most uh, vulnerable communities are also the poorest communities in the world who don't have ways to recover, to first of all, to protect themselves, and second, to recover from these natural disasters. And therefore, there are millions of people who are now living in slum-like conditions, if you can pass to the next slide. So cur currently, well, in the past 10 years, 23 million people have become homeless because of natural disasters. And currently 1.6 billion people live in inadequate housing or slums as we know it. So there is a their need to uh, find solutions for resilient, sustainable, affordable homes and cities. And the other thing I'd like to say is he's one of the most successful entrepreneurs and business leaders today internationally, extremely, extremely well known, mostly under the radar. So I hope he'll forgive me if I out him because 
as a young man with Lazar Frères, he brought in more billions of dollars to Lazar Frère than they ever realized they could have. And he doesn't speak French. It's a French bank. I think he mentioned with his own brain. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Gloria, for that uh, kind introduction. Top Rito, fellow panel members, honorable delegates uh, for, for attending. Uh, as a, as a global property developer with Capital Guidance, uh, my current firm, Altrinsic, was the previous firm I was with, uh, we do deploy between two to three hundred million dollars to several billion dollars for project development. Because of the, the nature of the large scale development that we do, we do have strong macro views that we look at, and increasingly we are becoming far more technology oriented. So if we turn the slide over, I will rapidly go through some of the macro issues that we face uh, globally when we look at property development. The first one is the world is aging rapidly. By 2020, the, we will have the peak youth era we'll do, where there will be more 65 year olds than there will be five year olds. So the human population is aging and aging quite rapidly. If you look at uh, the, I apologize for the small um, pictures, but the map on the right is 2,100. And you can see some of the countries that are left with young populations will mainly be in Sub-Saharan Africa, Central South Asia, and parts of Latin America. The rest of the world will be aging quite, quite rapidly. And this has huge implications for urban development and urban planning now. So if we turn the next page over, one of the other major issues is that the wealth is concentrating very rapidly. 1% of the population used to have 30% of the wealth in the year 2000. Now, 1% of the population has 50% of the wealth. So this is resulting in massive social disruption, uh, a lot of resentment among people that are being left behind, as some of the other speakers had shown, where people are working harder, but wages are not rising. The only way to address this is, as Dr. Yamanaka and Dr. Uh, Ricardo Pinto mentioned, is through education and through technology. So if we turn over to the next slide, uh, the other issue that's exacerbating uh, the quality of life for people is wages have been stagnant, but urban house prices have been rising rapidly. So the chart on the upper left-hand corner demonstrates that global house pricing, and this is a global average, uh, according to the IMF, have gone up over 60% over a 15-year period. Wages have not kept pace. So people increasingly within the urban landscape are being priced out of the housing market. If we turn over to the next page, uh, the world is rapidly urbanizing, as other speakers had mentioned. Currently, 50% of the world's population is urbanizing. By 2050, it'll be 70%. 80% of the world's population will be in emerging markets. And unless we plan properly for infrastructure, develop smart cities, the current issues of congestion, pollution, food security, physical security will actually start to get worse and worse. So now as global property developers, we cannot just focus on the bottom line. We have to focus on all our stakeholders within these urban environments. If you turn the next page over, Urban congestion is increasing. If we look at, uh, of the top 25 most congested cities, 20 of those are in the emerging markets. Uh, if we look at in cities across the world, the ability to conduct business for people to get from point A to point B is expensive, affecting the quality of life. But there are solutions. Technology will provide some very effective solution, solutions. And as we build out these cities, we have to take the, the, this into consideration. If we turn to the next page over, Education, as, as mentioned by Dr. Yamanaka and uh, Dr. Pinto, is going to become critical. Now, currently, education is evenly spread between the developed markets and the developing markets. But by 2030, uh, the pie chart is a bit small, but those two big slices on the right-hand side are China and India. So the, if you combine the rest of the emerging markets, they will account for 75% of tertiary degrees. So the investment within uh, emerging markets has to happen because that is where we have the youngest population. And we are aging very rapidly. So unless we educate our young population in Sub-Saharan Africa, Central South Asia, and Latin America, the, the gap between the rich and poor will widen. So education is the key. Next page, please. Um, as as uh, Saurabh and uh, Yvonne very kindly pointed out, the world, unfortunately, is warming. 
very rapidly. The, the upper right-hand corner, you can see we're at a 200-year high in temperature as, the, as we go towards global warming and we don't abate it, the most disruption will occur along, along the equatorial areas where you have large populations that are highly vulnerable. Next page, please. Uh, if we do look at renewable energy at this stage, the leaders in renewable energy right now, almost 80% of components are now produced by China. If we look at electric vehicles, 70% of components are produced by Japan, South Korea, and China. And with the prices coming down, the cost of solar energy, wind, renewable, hydro, waste energy is becoming competitive with fossil fuels. So we no longer have to destroy our planet if, if developers plan accordingly and develop buildings that are sustainable and renewable in nature. Next page, please. If we look at energy consumption, unfortunately, though, it is rising as countries per capita GDP rises, it is rising rapidly. So the push towards green energy and renewable energy is going to become vital. And in this case, one has to give credit to China. They've pushed down the cost almost 14, 15 percent per annum for solar batteries, solar energy, solar panels, uh, for storage of energy, and they continue to do so. If we look at, let's say, for the case of India, the solar energy now costs four rupees per kilowatt hour. A diesel genset costs 55 rupees per kilowatt hour. So fossil fuels are not only expensive, but they are polluting. So the shift is actually quite positive. So as negative as we are on, on global warming, you know, as, as, um, as uh, amazing work that Sarab and Yvonne do in, in reconstructing uh, disaster prone areas, there is a solution. And the solution has to be developed as an urban planner that is, that is, that is deploying billions of dollars. Next page, please. Um, these are the smart city technologies that are being employed right now. Uh, I won't go over all 18 technologies uh, because of the lack of time. But um, if we do look at deploying renewable energy, it will be with enhancement of 5G and Internet of Things the ability to significantly enhance the utilization of physical transport infrastructure, education distribution, healthcare distribution is going to be enhanced. So all those negative trends that we discussed in the past can be addressed by technology and has to be addressed by, by developers like ourselves. Next page, please. If we do look at smart technologies, however, they are, there is an explosion of data. Right now, only 1% of human data has been analyzed. Our brains are no longer capable of effectively understanding uh, the amount of data that's being generated. So artificial intelligence will become key. Uh, through one of our affiliated companies, Podia, run by Hamid Ansari, we've got a $2 billion patent portfolio, which may seem large, but we are actually a small player. 80% of all artificial intelligence patents are now being filed by 10 companies around the world. So there's a concentration of power, which one has to address as well, because this has to be more distributed, has to become more egalitarian, so that artificial intelligence is used for the people and not just for a select few people at the top. Next page, please. Uh, the large amount of data in AI requires a lot of analysis, but the infrastructure is already there. There's a lot of latent competency at the edge of the web, close towards cities with uh, computer power and serving power and parallel processing that we can now deploy. So I won't go through all the technicalities behind that, but developing a city requires as much investment in artificial intelligence, technology, distribution, as it does within physical infrastructure. Uh, next page, please. The economic benefits of AI will be very high within the emerging markets. Uh, the largest market right now probably will, will benefit will be China, which is gaining very strongly in patents within that area, as well as the United States and Europe. But a lot of this is now being exported to emerging markets. The emerging market to emerging market trade is increasing quite rapidly. In 1750, 75% of all world manufacturing was in the emerging markets. That went to a low in the late 1800s. We're now back at 50%. So the amount of investment now coming between countries that we thought would not trade with each other just 10 years ago is now very open. So capitalism is actually helping break down the bridges between the different barriers around the world. And we truly are becoming a global village. And hopefully we will benefit uh, with uh, the proliferation of artificial intelligence. The only negative aspect I do want to focus on on artificial in intelligence in the future is that there are studies showing that by 2050, at least 30% of human occupations will be displaced by AI, by 2,100, possibly almost 80%. So unless we invest significantly in education, we will leave our young people behind, and we have less and less young people over time. Next page, please. 
uh, the sharing business model is going to be very critical. We use our economic resources highly and efficiently. One of the worst economic utilizations is the automobile. The average automobile is only used 4% of the time. 96% of the time it's parked. So what is it doing? So as we start to get autonomous vehicles that are self-driving, then we have much more utilization of scarce resources. The same is with housing, physical infrastructure, transportation. 25% of food gets wasted even after it's been produced by the time it gets to the consumer because of lack of refrigeration, transportation breakdowns, and congestion. And this is going to become more and more of an issue, particularly as we get global warming and food scarcity and food, food issues because the weather will become more and more extreme throughout the world. Uh, but within the emerging markets, there's hope because there is a far more proclivity towards sharing assets, perhaps because there is a scarcity of assets. And this way, we can try to move people out of conditions of lower income, low quality housing into um, mixed developments that are based on, on a shared economy. Uh, next page, please. Uh, this is a revolution that we are taking a very serious look at, which is IoT, the Internet of Things. This is what will explode data around the world, but will also allow for significant efficiencies. So as all devices start to communicate to each other, you could say, well, let's say as these light bulbs are on right now, the moment we leave, the entire room will shut down, so we save electricity. But as the light bulb comes close to the end of its life, the light bulb will shift over here so it can be re repackaged in. So the, all these inefficiencies that are out there, IoT will resolve this. By 2030, there will be 100 times more IoT connected devices than there will be smartphones. So this revolution will actually increase productivity and it currently isn't priced into many market factors out, out there. Next page, please. Uh, electric vehicles will be critical to displace fossil fuels. If you look at the decline in battery pricing, it is about 15% per annum, which is in line with Moore's law. By 2025 to 2030, the average electric vehicle will be the same price as an internal combustion engine. The total cost of ownership will decline. The average internal combustion engine has over 2,000 moving parts. An electric vehicle has 16 moving parts. So this will negatively affect some parts of the world that are dependent on component manufacturing for ICEs. But this will benefit the world in terms of less, less dependency on fossil fuels. This is a revolution that's taking place. Now 75% of electric vehicle components are produced in, in three countries, as mentioned before, Japan, South Korea, and China. And they are pushing these lower priced products into the emerging markets, allowing the emerging markets to leapfrog the developed world, which is still dependent uh, on more expensive ICEs. Uh, next page, please. Uh, next page, please. Uh, so if we do look at autonomous driving, it is not only a matter of pollution, but it can also save on many human factors in terms of fatalities, accidents, utilization of parking. They say almost 50% of the traffic congestion is based on either people finding parking or getting parking spots. So as we st no longer need significant amounts of parking because cars are driving themselves and picking up and delivering people collectively, this takes actually significantly increases social indicators in urban planning. So we as urban planners can not only look at building a building that has great entertainment, that has office, mixed area, we have to look at healthcare, we have to look at education, and we have to look at all the connectivity of transportation and actually providing for, for all, all the people living in these areas. Next page, please. So this is just the end of the presentation. Uh, I, I do want to say uh, of great respect to all, all the panelists here. The amount of work that's being done is, is, is amazing and progressive. And going forward with the combination of AI, IoT, uh, urban planning that's smarter, uh, we believe that cities will actually become better over, over time. But this, does, this does, doesn't require people in the private sector like ourselves being cognizant not only of making money, but also ensuring that, that our societies that we are building are harmonious and are sustainable in nature. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for the uh, very positive message and, and such a substantive o overview. I think everybody appreciates that. And I'm sure in this audience, there's a lot of receptivity to the idea of emphasizing education as well. So, uh, uh, Murata, to facilitate my uh, participation here. Uh, as, thank you for your introduction. My name is Makiko Tagashira. I work for the uh, Division for Social Policy and Development of DESA. And uh, uh, our work is for actually for social development, inclusive social development. And uh, in my work, I also support the work of the Commission for Social Development, which has established 1946, one of the oldest uh, commission under the ECOSOC. And uh, uh, since 1995, uh, World, so World Summit for Social Development, we have been following up of the outcome of the social a World Summit for Social Development, focusing on uh, education, poverty, and then productive employment, decent work, and social integration slash social inclusion. So what we are talking here is actually many of them emanated from this summit because poverty was put on the agenda of the UN for the first time at this summit and also the importance of job wages uh, is very critical to social development and this is a one of the three pillars the social inclusion they put it already in that uh, 1995 this is one of the three pillars of social development because to creating an inclusive society where everybody can participate and have a stake in, in that society. That means leave no one behind, no exclusion. Regardless of your background, men and women, old and uh, young, uh, rich and poor, everybody has a part of the society. And this notion is very important. And also the uh, addressing inequality at that time was addressed. So all these principles, among all, uh, based on people-centered approach. So we are talking about what is development for? Is this economic development? But the economy is developed, but if the people are left behind, what is the purpose of the development? So people-centered, so the, even in the poverty, we're not doing something for the poor people, but the approach should be to assist the people living in poverty to move out of the poverty by themselves because they have a capacity but we just the barrier is too high that's why we have to reduce the barriers so this is my philosophical uh, the uh, policy <coughs> norm setting and also we are advocating for participatory approach which everybody now uh, agree and then also 2030 agenda adopted its multi-stakeholder approach. Before it was a government is doing something, but it's not simple. It's whole society approach is important. It's just that government is a major responsibility, but everybody, including local uh, government, civil society, academia, private sector, everybody has to be included in this uh, process. So that is also included in the 2030 agenda SDG. So that is also very important. And the 2030, when they adopted the, the notion of leave no one behind and uh, reach the farthest behind first, this notion is very important so that nobody is left behind. So that the, towards the end, social cohesion is enhanced and the stability of the society is important. So this, uh, so this uh, is a little bit of a back, backward, but uh, this commission last year, we have addressed the towards sustainable, resilient society, innovation and interconnectivity for social development. So during that last year, we talk about a lot of what is the benefit of the technology, but also what is the risks, because we only talk about the, the potential benefit, but also there must be uh, some risks. So how the social policy should address these risks, including inequality, widening gaps, and to have access to the ICT, but those who are not. So that uh, that's last year, and uh, in the priority seems is pri uh, poverty. And this year, just February this year, we are addressing inequality. Because as many people pointed out, now inequality 
has increasing. Uh, it's not that simple because uh, global, actually inequality between countries is actually declining. That means the gap between the richest and the poorest country was declining because of income rise in many developing countries. However, within, within in, uh, country inequality is increasing, especially in OECD country. Uh, that means uh, advanced countries. To the point that, uh, as you know, the Picardy said, to the point where is Downton Abbey era, which is uh, only, 19, uh, only 20th century. So this is not a good indicator because, the, as you said, in the state, like in 1978, wage has stagnated, even though productivity increased, but people are not getting enough wages. So this is one of the, the major kind of concern. But if we don't do anything, this inequality is getting much widening. And the, the, the company, the, the profit, the profits of the company is not getting into the people's wages. So therefore, the middle class is kind of falling into poverty. And that is not a good thing because if we don't have a vibrant uh, middle class, the economy is slowed down because the demand is going down. So it's kind of getting into a vicious circle. The, the positive side is some developing countries actually reduce inequality because of the uh, policy, uh, tax, progressive tax, or social protection systems, including cash transfers. So there are, uh, if there's a political will and good policy, the equality can be reduced. This is the conclusion of this commission. And so next uh, priority seems the next year is actually decided as affordable housing and social protection system for all to address homelessness. So I've heard a lot of people talking about affordable housing and the homelessness and I was quite uh, surprised because we thought, you know, th this is an area uh, we are not touched upon before. So actually we are trying to collaborate with UN Habitat. But uh, this is a new area. But the way we started uh, digging in a little bit, the drivers of homelessness, what is the cause of homelessness, this is a quite uh, uh, multifaceted, uh, challenging issues. And it's also emerging because, uh, as you know, like New York or San Francisco or London, Dublin, many large cities actually experience the increased number of homeless people because of many issues, but finance, financialization of housing, also inequality, but also, uh, as somebody said, natural disasters, uh, uh, or man-made uh, man disasters, or some personal issues, um, mental issues, uh, high cost of health care, or evictions, uh, many multifaceted issues. So I thought, uh, uh, I think we have to actually study more because not so many, uh, for example, how many people are homeless? There's no global data. And what is the definition of homeless? Those people who are open space or those people who was out, like a slum who has living in the roof, are they counted as a homeless? Or there's many issues which has not been clearly defined. So I think it's a new challenge, kind of new challenge in emerging areas. But as I today I learned, there's a lot of already concrete actions uh, concrete tools and the practices already being done, so I would be very uh, keen to learn uh, from you all. And then I think, as you said, technological advance is really uh, the, the biggest tool because many countries are leapfrogging and this is also possible. And then the, 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 the knowledge sharing of good practices is very, very important. So I hope that the uh, next commission, that all the member states can learn from each other and then uh, learn from your uh, the forum. Thank you very much. Uh, and then we look forward to your successful interview. Uh, thank you very much, Makiko, and thank you for giving us the normative framework and, and some of the challenges for, for the development world within that framework. 
Uh, we have actually passed our time, and so there's not going to be any uh, space for questions uh, and answer at this point. Uh, the next session, however, is a follow-up to this, uh, and it will look at uh, rural and urban communities and how we can balance them through the digital services. So with that, uh, I, I will close the session. Thank you. Thank you very much to Pier Paolo Saporito for the invitation to this conference. Overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity, it is an act of justice. Next, please. Mexico in the world, poverty in Mexico. Mexico has about uh, one, 120 million of people. It is about 1.64% of the world's population, 70.3 billion. Poverty in Mexico is the 43.6%, about 53.4 million people. 70.6% is in extreme, extreme poverty, about 9.1 million. Next. In Mexico, we have uh, an institution that measure the poverty. And uh, this institution uh, has uh, about six dimension, seven with uh, income. And it said that in Mexico, a family of four is in poverty if, if their monthly income is less than 565 US dollar. And if, if we don't have three of this dimension. Next, please. This is a, an example of the five states with the most poverty and extreme poverty in 2016 in million of people. The state of Mexico, Veracruz, Chiapas, Puebla, and Oaxaca. Next. Being also the third largest worldwide for the present of residents even office. Fiera Roma and the city of Rome have taken up the crucial economic challenge launched by Development Cooperation in 2018 sets out the call to the main protagonists from all sectors of the cooperation supply chain around the new and the central discussion table. ESCO 2019 will showcase the widest business horizon for all the actors of the development cooperation, with Africa as a special focus. The event will enable its participants to expand to other areas where private initiatives may introduce sustainable business grasping a present opportunity. Sustainability, education of training, youth empowerment, innovation technology, job creation, good practices, social responsibility, opportunity sharing will be the key words to start developing and widening of that in the cooperation system during the event. Another great protagonist is South America, thanks to the presence of Colombia, among many contributions, for example, with the highly focus event to promote the Baila Italian Latin American Institute of Italian Cooperation. ILA is a special institution that uh, based in Rome with the present of the 21 countries for Latin America. A challenge and is an innovative way of representing the opportunity to connect with the development of the Facing the challenge of creating a USP model, we have developed a bouquet of five different and connected formats. Format number one, the Expo. 30,000 square meters is a vision space for innovative products and services from many fields. Agribusiness value chain, agriculture and irrigation, environmental sustainability, energy, housing, construction, infrastructure, processing technology, ICT, food, saving and preservation, logistics, transportation, healthcare and sanitary equipment, disaster prevention, education and training, democratic governance, fair trade, industrialization 4.0. Format, format number two, B2B. A structured program and business meeting for exhibitors to encounter country delegation of high institutional profile, investment and development organization, strategic development project, 
ministers, association, chamber of commerce, agency, financial and funding institution, and in you. Format number three, workshop and conference. An original platform of conference, round table, workshops, or key things. Format number four, the action floor. I did now have the opportunity to connect demand and supply in a concrete way. A pilot project presented in Italy for the first time will be organized thanks to the cooperation for ex Italian Agents of Development Cooperation, European Commission, Polytechnic di Milano, and Prima Foundation. A real action to relaunch a selection of valuable projects that passes examination to be present to the potential sponsor, impact investor, and other significant player. Format number five country focus. A format that offers governance and delegation a privileged presentation platform of the needs and opportunity of investment more strategic in their countries. Somalia, Niger, Eritrea, Senegal, Kenya, Colombia, Ethiopia, Tunisia, Djibouti, Zimbabwe, Bolivia, Uzbekistan, Uganda, Vietnam. There are some of them because there are more, much more. Expo 2018 is a process. Thank you very much. We waiting you, all of you, in Rome. Okay? Thank you.